Hello and welcome to today's discussion about barriers to progression for Black people in the UK music industry. My name is Roger Wilson. I'm co-founder of Black Lives in Music, a new organization focusing on the issues of racial diversity in today's music industry. This is one of a number of fascinating sessions involving Black Lives in Music, sponsored by TuneCore, powered by Sound City and Guesthouse. The road to success in any industry involves talent, commitment, hard work, and luck. The road to success in the music industry is at least as tough, but minus the most obvious pathways. Add to that the ongoing issues for people of color and the journey becomes more one of an odyssey with violent twists and turns of fortune along the way. Today, we're discussing how we can make that journey less arduous and straighten out the road. Earlier this year, Black Lives in Music commissioned a survey on the lived experience of Black music creators and industry professionals. The survey engaged with nearly 2,000 respondents. The subsequent report now published has produced key information and an insight into the experience of, of um, people in the, Black people in today's music industry. I talked to today's guest to discuss the findings of the report and to talk about what can be done to bring about change. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Ben Winter. He's a music and media executive with 20 years of experience in the music industry. He's founder of Unstoppable Music Group, a one-stop shop focusing on all aspects of the music industry from con concept to product. He's been a champion for talent development and has been the vision behind groundbreaking initiatives such as the Hitmaker Fund and Power Up an initiative to end anti-Black racism and create a fairer and more equitable music industry in the UK. Audrey Gray has over a decade in the music and entertainment industry, providing artists and tours services, as well as supporting music investors with event productions and creative projects. She's passionate about the opportunity to mentor others and helps creatives to take control of their careers. Audrey also works with organizations designing business structures and systems that foster sustainability. She is Chief Executive Officer of the Gospel Music Industry Alliance. Cheryl Nwosu is a practicing lawyer and the first chairperson of the Black Music Coalition, an organization created in June 2020 to tackle direct and indirect racism affecting the careers and progression of Black music executives in the UK music industry. She's a vocal advocate on issues of racial equality, equity, inclusion, and diversity in all areas of her professional life. Last but definitely not least, Lavender Rodriguez, also known as just Lavender, is currently studying composition at the Royal Northern College of Music. She was resident composer in the National Youth Orchestra, having had works performed at the Tate Modern and the ICC Birmingham. If her compositional talent wasn't enough, Lavender is also a talented violinist and bass guitarist. To all of our guests, I wish you a warm welcome. Hi. Ben, um, if I come to you first, um, you've been a real champion for developing talent and um, looking at the beginning of the talent pipeline, grassroots involvement. What are some of the problems that, um, that you've seen um, pre preclude the involvement of young people of color from a pathway into the industry? Um, I think at, at, at grassroots level, um, it, it's grassroots level, it, you can access the industry, it's what happens after that. So getting in and, you know, at an internship level or, you know, uh, uh, the first kind of entry level position um, is a possibility, it happens it's once you are looking to actually be remunerated for the work that you're doing, that's when things start to, to become difficult on an on a executive side. From an artistic point of view, I think, you know, it's, it's always been difficult for Black artists um, of any genre, especially those coming from what we'd call the Black music genres, which are, you know, your, your hip hop, your, your rap, your R&B, et cetera. Um, and then I think we're streaming the tide kind of change because no longer would a gatekeeper be able to determine who would be allowed in and who wouldn't um, and which executives would be allowed in and who wouldn't. But the actual streaming meant that, that artists would actually be able to put their music up 
would be able to engage with audiences and those audiences would decide whether they would enter the industry or not. And as a result, you know, that's kind of spawned many, many young black entrepreneurs that have gone on to do exceptionally well. And, and those that uh, have created cottage industries that are maintaining a living and those that are slowly building um, their businesses. So it's created an opportunity for to enter the industry, which was very different to when I began in the industry, which mm-hmm. was very much a kind of a situation where um, it was about the gatekeepers. And, you know, you had to engage with those gatekeepers and they made a decision as to whether you'd be in or whether you wouldn't. And if you kind of look at the history of that, a lot of those, a lot of the people that made it in, made it in via record stores, MC and DJ and et cetera, et cetera, because mm-hmm. those were the only real pathways to get. And even myself, I, you know, I was a blonde haired MC f- to get into that, even though I knew that actually I wanted to be on the executive side, but I knew that there was, there was little to no chance of me actually entering the industry unless I had a mic in my hand and created this persona around myself that made people gravitate towards me and want to engage with me so that that has often been um the journey for a lot of people of 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 black and african heritage trying to enter the music industry thanks ben that's um that's really insightful and um you know very very interesting to 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 have an understanding of that um in terms of you know the, the commercial side of it i'm interested to bring in lavender at this point because um obviously I, I don't want to. I don't even want to try to to put you in the pocket of of um, Western classical music. But obviously, you are at a at a currently at a conservatoire uh, of music. Um, you've had a fantastic journey already, um, and it sounds as though your experience of grassroots learning through, you know, your local music hub, for example, seemed to work for you. I'm not sure that's the case uh, more widely, but I wondered if you just wanted to to give us a perspective from the the classical side of things. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, When I started out, I was lucky to be offered the choice between paid violin lessons or free cello lessons within a group. And that was simply because apparently in my classroom, I was just bored and I needed more stimulating. So they're like, please, can she learn an instrument? She needs to do something. Um, And without that opportunity, I don't think I would have gone into music. Like, having the opportunity to do something that wasn't that cost worthy also really engaging was really good um people don't have that around the country and again i sing praises to hampshire there's many faults but hampshire does like really big up the music hub it's kept the music going it's kept the funding going towards um people wanting to learn music and just unfortunately it's just very white majority so the musicians that come out of it aren't like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I think, yeah, uh, because I enjoyed that so much, my parents then saw that it was, ne- again, never an option. And so we kind of pursued that and tried to fit that into my life financially and time-wise. Um, otherwise, it, it just, there there are a lot of opportunities outside of that that I've just missed out. There would be summer schools, and kind of extra trips where I'd go to my parents and I'd be like, look, I really want to go. And they'd be like, no, we do not have the money. <laughs> like, please just study and like concentrate on like getting good grades and then that's fine. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it's a case of looking hard and unfortunately like it's very time consuming. Um, if I would say like the best way is like the best thing the music industry could do is just make it so abundantly clear. Like th- we want to help you. And so these are the different routes that you can go down. Um, Cause I know definitely now, like I literally applied to everything. I like sit on the internet, just like my mum, like who still does to this day, just sits on the internet and looks at different like workshops and stuff. Um, I think that's just the, in the classical industry, it's the best way to just like make yourself known, you then connect with people, um, it, it's that whole who you know rather than what you know unfortunately mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a composer we're very like introverted sorry <laughs> like you then have to like change your persona and your personality especially as a black person like you stand up but you don't like people are like why are you here like we what is a black composer like we don't 
we don't recognize you in our space but then at the same time like because of that they're not used to that presence it's a different energy that we bring just off the bat um it's different music that we bring as well like as well as being classically trained like my experiences are completely different my interests are completely different to any other composer and so yeah you kind of have to work double as hard to make that seem the norm unfortunately um and kind of fit in within the canon of what is expected of, in the UK sure and um yeah that that um lack of of welcoming of um different voices in the space is um is is what precludes from real diversity um being in in the sector um audrey uh, the, i'd just like to bring you in there because um you know that's really some really interesting insights already from both ben and lavender um i i'm thinking more widely in terms of looking through the lens of the united kingdom and you know i was an instrumental teacher in in both the independent and state sectors for quite some time and in fact I did actually teach in in um in Hampshire for a short period of time uh, as well so I do know that area um I have to say in all of that time I didn't teach many young people who looked like me nor did I see teachers more than myself who looked like me um there's got to be a real problem in terms of provision um, of, of, you know, um, at grassroots level of, of instrumental music. Um, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, the real lack of effort um, that's, that seems to me to, to still exist in terms of addressing inequality of opportunity. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work that can be done from, you know, school up. And I do see a lot of youth overnight, also, overnight, oh organizations doing a lot more now mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering how impactful that is that is because hearing these stories here it's almost a sort of talent code switching you have to do to get to the point that you need to get to and um, just like how Ben was saying you know if you didn't have that mic in his hand he wouldn't get to where he, he needs to be I think we do that almost without knowing it that that's what we're doing you know that you have this strategy that's going to get you somewhere um and i think back to how i originally started in music industry i was doing backing vocals for everybody and i wanted to do studio work and that's how i ended up being able to do studio work is just hanging around in the studio a bit too long after the other vocalists had left and like yeah how do you do that real to real thing okay yeah let me see how you do that <laughs> then sort of getting employed to take bookings and the rest of it and then just learning a craft from there so there is a lot of that I think there needs to be more mentorship coming from you know labels and the rest of it yeah internships it just says use me mm. it doesn't say teach me mm. and that that's that's really really concerning and you know the fact that we now say we should pay internships it's still saying use me it's still not saying mentor me and that's that I think that is a huge chunk of what the problem is, is that you're, nobody's imparting knowledge one to another. It's almost as if you feel like, you know, they might get bigger than me. So, do you know what I mean? Those egos are coming into play at the same time as you shouldn't be here in the first place. So why should I give you a leg up? Mm, so yeah. it, it is, it's complex, it's complex. Thanks for that, Audrey. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, there's a strand that's running uh, through what everyone has uh, contributed. I'd like to turn to Cheryl now, because um, for me, there's some intersection here between, you know, race and socioeconomic background, the haves and the have nots. You know, when we're talking, as Audrey has done in terms of internships, you know, um, you know, not everyone can afford to be an intern. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. I certainly wouldn't have been able to, to um, have got by on next to nothing if if uh, at all um and um you know th that really does um happen you know to a disproportionate number of people of color who traditionally occupy uh, these spaces and, and i just wondered what your thoughts were uh, on on that i think it's really interesting because listening to everybody speak I see the similarities between music and the legal profession, that um, the access to those professions are not very obvious, mm -hmm. that there does need to be more onus on the profession itself to open its doors, to signpost people towards those routes into specific careers. Um, and also 
um, you know, when young people do come into the industry, because I remember when I was training to be a barrister, I was, it was unfunded. So when I left law school, um, happily I stayed at home throughout law school, so my debts weren't so high. Um, my position of training, which is called a pupillage, was unfunded for 12 months. Um, luckily, partway through that, my inn provided me with um, a good amount of funding. But these issues are exactly the same for people wanting to especially go into the executive side of the music industry. So I think the onus needs to be placed more upon the industry because it's you're right and it's been identified that you know schools have projects and run initiatives and um, people like us give up our time and mentor, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the real opening up of an industry has to happen within the industry and it has to be backed by, um, by a real intention to open up the doors because you will always get people who perhaps they know about the industry or they know about particular routes because of you know, parents, friends, and et cetera, et cetera. But when you're talking about the vast majority of people, and then when we specify down to people that look like us, people from um, uh, marginalized groups in society, they are not the ones that are gonna get the messaging that they are welcome, that there are these roots, that they are capable, and that if not, they will get sufficient training and or funding. So that, that kind of loud messaging really needs to come from the industry. Thanks, Cheryl. If I just want to um, just take that one a little step further with you, if you don't mind, because obviously um, you, you, you said you've made some absolutely totally pertinent um, comments there. Um, but we also know that there is a, you know, further down the you know the the pathway um there is a real lack of um equality in terms of gender and the intersection with color um and i just i just wondered what thoughts you had about um you know looking at the grassroots side of this and what we need to do when it comes to you know making um signposting and and improving opportunities for for young black women yeah well Thinking specifically about young black women, um, who are my passion, by the way, um, young black women, you, as, as I've said, young people can often find their way through roots and connections into the industry, but not enough of them. So there's, there's the lack. And then as they move through the industry, there's the inequality of opportunity, which I think you yourself Roger, spoke about. And so there's even more lack. And then there's the culture within the industry, which is not necessarily hospitable to women or black people. And then there's the attrition rates. And so we have an even more lack. And then there is the failure of organizations to properly handle their black staff, their female staff, and give them, as I've said, the access to opportunity and the support the support network that they need to move up into middle ranks, to move up into senior ranks. And so with all of those things added together and also a number of other factors, which I've probably missed, that's when you get to the position where there is an absolute dearth of black female professionals um, it, within the industry. And as I've, it, you know, I've enumerated a number of reasons why that is, each one of those need their own solution. Each one of those need their own, um, as it were, uh, th their own, you need to go at those separately. It can't just be, oh, let's get a whole load of young black women and place them in the industry. Because if you haven't changed the cultural working environment and it remains inhospitable to them, then nothing's going to change. If you throw numbers in, it doesn't mean that in five or 10 years time, you're gonna see the fruits of those numbers um, going in. So there needs to be actually a real kind of, and this is why I used the word intentional before, it has to be an intention on the part of the industry because by now, when you have people like Ben and when and no doubt people like Audrey and, and, and Lavender speaking about these issues and articulating them in such a crystal clear way, there is absolutely no excuse why programs, initiatives and just general effort hasn't been put in 
to, to eradicate these issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, again, uh, you know, the, the, these problems of, of infrastructure, uh, I think, are going to be a, a thread that uh, goes through this conversation. Um, I just, just want to go to Lavender now, um, just moving from grassroots, looking at the college situation, conservatoires. Um, I mean, that's a Victorian name in itself, isn't it, conservatoire? Um, but, um, you know, the I, I know that the, the college that you're at at the moment, uh, Lavender, is is aware of the changes that need to come about. Um, with under 3% teaching staff in UK conservatoires being of Black, Asian or ethnically diverse background, how do you see that affecting progress for students of colour uh, in the sector? Um, I think one of the things I've noticed is that actually there are less students going into music, into higher education. Like when I started, there are, there are a number of us, it wasn't great. Um, I had a fair few friends and now that I'm coming to finish my degree, there are even fewer of us. And speaking to a friend even within the past week, um, there was a point where he thought about, you know, coming in, he's luckily here, but he turned around and was like, I don't see anyone like me in this institution. I don't think I'd fit in. I don't feel comfortable there. I don't know who I'd be friends with. I don't know what the teaching's like. Um, and simply that, just the lack of faces, um, either just in the brochures or just in the staff and student body as well, puts people off just mm -hmm. like as it is. Um, it's really gutting. So I hope like it does improve in the future, um, but it takes brave people, unfortunately. Like I don't want this situation to signal to institutions and organizations that this is fine we're speaking about this we've got the knowledge we're fighting for this and so they don't have to do anything like there are a few people here and there who give up mental well-being their physical well-being to in order to pave the way for everyone else that means that there are so many people like under the the level of the iceberg that are struggling to like reach that level um, and so, yeah, the onus is on institutions to actually, you know, take stock of who they've got in the building as it is, um, who can they help support, either move up the ranks or who they can bring in, um, what representation they have at the top. And also within like the student body as well, like people are coming to audition days, they're coming to open days and they're looking at the, their potential like colleagues and friends and life mates. And if they're not seeing anyone like themselves, then they're not going to want to come. They want to stay in a place where they feel safe. It is it is a hostile world, unfortunately, mm. just across um, the at least Western classical industry. It, people don't understand. They don't have even the basic level of education that we just inherently live a different life. Even though we're brought up, we're born in the UK, we have a completely different style of life um, and completely different goals as well. In the, in the music industry, it's not as simple as... I'm going to learn my instrument, be really good, and then join an orchestra. It's, I'm going to learn my instrument to the point that I will be noticed when I go to the audition room, that when I apply uh, compositionally, that I stand out even more. Um, and then within that, I'm going to maintain that and maintain that in a financial situation, but also mentally, because people have their own prescribed kind of viewpoints and opinions on what should be played and who should be playing and etc cetera, etc cetera. it's it's harsh and I don't blame people that don't want to apply to conservatoire like you know after four years I'm tired too sure. <laughs> it is, it's hard um, and there are so many just inherent patriarchal things that happen and I look back and I'm like I don't know why I'm continuing but also I wanted this degree, I wanted to learn more and I will learn more. And out of this degree, not only am I going to go away with that information that I want, but I'm also going to change the pathway so that it is easier, so that I can represent people and say, I've made it through, it's terrible, sure, but you can make it through as well. <laughs> like it's doable. Mm -hmm. And there are so many nice people as well, like staff and student wise, like we have an amazing group now at the university, um, we speak bi-weekly, we're saying this is, these are the ideas, these are every small tidbit of our institution and the industry that needs to change inherently, whether you tear the system down or whether you literally just like break it apart and slowly build it back up. 
So yeah, as 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 well as there being faults, there are also so many people that do understand and do want to change. But unfortunately, things are gate kept at the highest position, and that's sure. where you've got to tackle. Um, but things don't change unless you go through it. Like you've got to kind of go through that pathway, and then you can help others keep that ladder going, build some more up, type thing. Yeah. Th thanks, Lavender. Um, I, and I just, yeah, I, I know there isn't anyone on, on this um, call who isn't thankful that you have stuck it through and that you, 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 you're still there and you, you're flying the flag because uh, actually it's very funny. Um, I, I, I do tell a story myself of um, going to one open day many, many years ago. In fact, I don't think most of the conservators had open days when I went, um, but the one that I did go uh, was probably one of the oldest institutions and uh, that was my, um, you know, that that was my lasting memory right until this day um, was the absence of, um, you know, of of anyone uh, being in that space that reflected anything other than what you would expect to be there uh, traditionally and historically. Um, ben, I wonder if I could just bring you in on, on that in terms of, you know, uh, talent development and, um, you know, that importance for uh, people uh, to to see. Uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, and their own identity reflected in the space uh, in terms of um, when you're working uh, with with young developing talent? 100%. Um, I didn't go to a conservatoire, but I did kind of do a music degree of kinds. Um, <laughs> so I majored in music business and minored in, in music production. And it was one of the first courses of its kind. And I think what when I speak to people that are coming out of those courses now, the, the distinction that is very clear to me is number one, we were being taught by professionals that have been there, seen it, done it. Um, and number two, there was black representation that let me know as a 18 year old, I can do this. Mm -hmm. So I was extremely fortunate, you know, that Stevie Wonder's manager was teaching about management and negotiation skills and a and R. I was very fortunate that, you know, we had somebody that had been a part of Soul to Soul and, you know, played on amazing, um, played for amazing artists, teaching us about production, teaching us about various different historical parts of the music industry and seeing those two successful black men in that space not only lecturing, teaching, imparting their knowledge, experience and wisdom, but also looking at them and going, you're actually operating in the commercial sector still and you're thriving. That, that enabled me to understand that it was possible, that I could do it. And it would be difficult because, you know, I had conversations with them and they, they explained some of their own personal journeys. But to this day, those gentlemen still give me encouragement. Um, you know, one in particular, I will still call and lean on and ask for advice for 20 years on mm -hmm. because they were there at the very beginning of my journey and were my cheerleaders and were constantly encouraging me even when I had wobbles. And, and having somebody that culturally can understand the nuances of, you know, the doubts that you might have or the difficulties that you're facing that isn't just going to dismiss it as, oh, you just need to work harder, but actually understands the fact that my mum didn't want me doing music, <laughs> wanted, me to, wanted me to be a lawyer or a barrister. <laughs> and, you know, the fact that I'd completely gone off of that course and gone somewhere else and being able to understand the, the cultural element of that desire for my parent and how to deal with that um it was invaluable for me you know and and I often say this the only reason that I survived in the industry for as long as I did is because those people I, I would run into them or I'd make the phone call and they would give me the energy the belief to continue on and I think that is so important and when I speak to a lot of young people that are in universities in colleges that are doing it now number one I'm, I find that they're taught a lot of theory by people that haven't been there and done it mm -hmm, that's the mm -hmm, first problem mm -hmm. and then the second problem is that there aren't enough people that look like them in there 
that are successful for them to be able to look at and say, okay, well, if you're saying that and you've been there and you've done it, I can engage with you and, and I can actually make this happen for myself. And then, you know, as you enter the industry, it, it's a similar thing. Um, again, I was very, very, you know, God smiled on me coming into the game because I was very lucky to, to enter a record label. And at that record label, the head of business affairs was a black man. And, you know, to see that person in that position um, was inspiring. You know, the head of marketing was a black man. Um, <laughs> you know, so I was really lucky that these people were there. There was, there was a, a label within that major label and the head was a black man again. So I was lucky that I saw that representation very early um, that I was building relationships with successful black people, black producers that were killing it in the game. So I was able to, number one, believe, and I'm not someone that's short on belief, but you know, everybody needs to see, see something sometimes to, to help them um, keep going. And number two, there was always somebody there that I could speak to. And I think 90% of those people, I still, you know, I was on a call with one of them today. I still speak to those people because it was, it was almost like where, where I didn't come from a background of affluence and in the right circles and all the rest of it and had to find my way into the industry. It's almost like all of those people kind of saw that and went, oh, you, you've made it. You've made it this far. We're going to ensure that you stay the course mm. and helped me to keep going. And that's why for me, it's so important that you know, as as I'm getting older, <laughs> I hate saying that. As I'm getting older, Leave it, um, <laughs> as I'm maturing, um, <laughs> you know, it's really important to impart that knowledge and let people know that that it's possible. And you know, you're going to have ups, you're going to have downs, but you have to keep on pushing through if it's really what you want to do, because mm -hmm. you can make it, and you can form your own networks, and those networks can keep you going so even though you might not be in whatever's deemed as the cool kids club there's territories there's you know different countries there's different places you can go there's different people you can speak to and you can form those relationships for me I, I did a lot of work outside of the UK because in the UK I didn't feel like I could really get where I was going sure. so sure. I was embraced in America I was embraced in Europe and I was like, okay, I'm build those relationships and work with them and then came back to the UK. And it's just about giving people that education, I feel. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ben. That's, um, I, 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 I actually do believe, you know, 110% in this, you know, uh, concept of seeing is believing because I, I, I think it's inspiration that has driven me um, in, you know, throughout my career as a musician, it's seeing other people and being inspired by them. There's just no price that you can put on what that does for an individual. Um, Cheryl, if you don't mind, I just wanted to pick up on something that, um, that Ben mentioned earlier on uh, in that conversation, which I think is very pertinent. I, I, I'm a, a parent myself and um, it's really interesting to, to think, you know, when my children were growing up and they got to that bit where they were doing their, their exams, it's all I could think in my head was, please do subjects that are going to take you through life and pay my pension um, and look <laughs> after me when I when I get to that point. And, and it's and it's reality, isn't it? I mean, it's, it, it's the, you know, you're thinking, you know, your 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 initial instinct as a parent is one of protection for your children. So if you know what's in front there in terms of you know, the trials and tribulations of trying to make it in a business that does not necessarily guarantee you payback as a profession in the same way as say, for example, the profession that, that um, you, know, you are so um, uh, fantastically uh, um, uh, doing in, um, what, uh, you know, what is, you know, what, what should we be thinking about there? And, and it's, it's, it's a genuine problem, isn't it? Particularly for uh, Afro-Caribbean um, uh, heritage uh, um, families where they just want the best for their children knowing how hard they, they themselves have struggled. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And 
you know, I sit here, here as a lawyer, but my dad wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we had to have a conversation about that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult and it kind of like links into why, again, I say that there has to be signposting from the industry because actually, even though we're saying, you know, parents look out and think, oh, you know, maybe they'll push their children towards certain careers because they think that's going to be the best for them. It's a changing landscape for starters in terms of like careers, like nobody's having jobs for life anymore. Like, I think we are still young enough, Ben, to be called like the slashies. So, you know, lawyer slash consultant slash chairperson, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really difficult, I think now for people to even foretell um, what's going to happen in the future with industries but also when we think about it at, like parents of my generation were making decisions based on certain facts so mm -hmm. that for example they were immigrants here so they're thinking about you know they're thinking about oh will my daughter even necessarily be able to break into you know an, an artistic career if that that was something that I had suggested but I think as, you know, as time moves on and as history moves on and as we move on and equip ourselves with more and more knowledge, our desires are going to grow. And that's the one thing that I actually I see from the young people that I mentor and stuff like that. Their desires now, like their professional desires now are not simple, you know, <laughs> not just, you know, I just want to, oh, I want to be a lawyer. It's like, it's either really specific or they have all these creative aims. And so that's where, again, they may be slightly removed from their parents' knowledge. So there may be a knowledge gap. So their parents may not be able to signpost them. So I come full circle back to placing the onus on the industries who say they are interested in diversity, who say their doors are open to young people. Well, look, you, we've got a landscape of young people filling up and they, will, they, they, they would be only too keen. And there is, you know, there is never a lack of talent. That, if that is a, do you know what I mean? If that is a thought process in, in recruiters' minds at the moment, they need to, to, to disabuse themselves of that thought. We all know there is never a lack of talent from our communities. So once again, it comes back to, you know, opening your doors and opening them intentionally so that people hear about opportunities, mm -hmm. parents and young people alike. And I think um, informative talks such as this, your organization, my organization, power up everything that everyone here is involved in are doing some of the groundwork, but I will not let the industry off the hook. They got to do it, but, you know, they got to be a big um, motor behind us, pushing, pushing, pushing. Sure, sure. I, I, I just, um, yeah, I, I'm just, before I move on to the, the to, um speak with with uh, Audrey I, I would just say unfortunately as 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 I say I you know I my um, experience has been steeped in um, commercial particularly jazz and classical um, and I would unfortunately suggest that there are those and I would suggest they are those with implicit bias that would suggest that there is a lack of uh, talent within our community and I think that um, just shows a lack of of, um, uh, of information um, on on their part um, but just to just to pick up and and to move to Audrey uh, on on the um, the, the the topic of of the industry um well just looking at qualifications um the blim report shows black creators with music qualifications earned less at 1463 pounds per month compared with white creators who earned 1936 pounds per month Black women with qualifications are paid significantly lower at £1,187 per month. These disparities need to be rectified in the interests of fairness. But of course, if you're not making enough, then you're not going to be, oh, sorry, you're, rather you're going to be deterred from staying in the music business. Um, that's as opposed to those doing better who will naturally aspire to be successful. And we know largely the demographic of those who are doing better. Um, uh, uh, Audrey, I'm just really just seeking a, um, a comment from you in terms of how the, the industry has to change this. I mean, this is, this is not something that can continue, surely. I do think 
kind of slightly going back to what everybody's been saying, I think a lot of the time our talent is belittled because we are just so talented naturally. It's like belittled and therefore your parents telling you, my mum did that, you get a bit, you better learn to type. <laughs> what do you mean music? You better learn to type. That's what yeah. she was at, do you understand? Because she just thinks music is, is not, it's not viable. Do you understand? And so I think that struggle to get into positions is because in a sense at home, our talent is belittled. And then in the public eye, it is then also belittled because it's masked with things like urban. That's up there with Bane for me. I just want to say. Oh, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, and, and we just get thrown into this one pot of genres and then because we're black, and but, but yet you don't want to admit that that's where you're getting the music from. So we'll just call it urban. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, again, you, we're having to overprove our skills in many fields. And um, in many fields, that, that's just, it's not translating at all. I know that, well, most of my work has been with gospel artists and the gospel, especially UK market, is not as commercially viable as much of the other international markets. But by the same token, that means my grind is harder than anybody else's. But if I go to Sony to apply for an A&R job, they're going to look at my CV and think, oh, she's worked with gospel artists. So she's been... Mm -hmm. like, choir rehearsals for the last 15 years that's mm -hmm. what I've been doing whereas I have a much wider range of skills because I've been booking agent I've been road manager I've done do you know what I mean because I've had to do it to help to build the industry so I think that there needs to be some sort of measurement well fairity in, in measuring how we look at a person's CV and how we analyze who we bring on board based on those skills because the music industry is not about qualifications it isn't it's yeah I, I well I'm with that I you know I... <laughs> it's about skill base when it boils down to it and the more you get closer to creativity is the less viable that becomes so yeah there is a I think we really need to examine that how mm. are we judging the talent that's out there what mm. happened, and how are those opportunities slipping through the net because of those those lots of things there's been for sure for sure there's been a lot more younger managers coming up so um, artists are coming to market younger mm. so you've got your just set of grime artists come to to the market younger and they're bringing along their brethren as their managers those guys are picking up knowledge that like that mm -hmm. because they want to see their partner get to where they 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 want to get to so encouraging the development of people like youth managers for example mm -hmm. Amazing. I think Ben used They've got a lot to teach us. They still got a lot to teach us. Yeah, yeah I think it was Ben who said something like gatekeeping. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the gatekeepers that cause the problem that you're I talking see. about because they see it. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. I think yeah. it's willful ignoring right. of superb yeah. talent. Plus, you're a woman. They so don't it in. You can't do that. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Plus, you're okay. a woman. Oh, you're, how old are you? Because it can never tell. Okay, so if I'm if I'm certain number, I'm too young or I'm too old. Yeah, that gets mixed in that you're black, you're a woman, you're in music industry. What are you doing here? Do you know what I mean? It's like it's, it's about it, it comes back to ownership and you know, just touching on what you said about urban, for example, mm -hmm. it, it's no coincidence that that term and those departments were set up the same year that in America, um, rap music was the biggest selling genre. Correct. Right. It's no, that's no coincidence that all of a sudden they became urban departments mm -hmm. that, you know, we know what that was about. It was about mm -hmm. taking the ownership away, which means right. that you take away um, people's identity, oh, yeah. their strength and, and their belief in being able to be successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you continue to oppress a, a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we've all run with this term for, for a long time. I've always hated the term. Mm -hmm. Don't use the term. It is what it is. But I think, as you pointed out, you know, there are young people that are coming through that are super talented and all they require is an opportunity. And, you know, if you're coming from a low socioeconomic background, ultimately you want to turn your life around. You want to change the way you're living. So you have a different kind of hunger. You have a different type of drive because you know that I'm going back to a place that isn't necessarily safe, yeah. isn't necessarily clean as you know there's all these different things that 
these factors that you don't want to be around. So the hunger is different and the work rate is different and the willingness to learn is different. And sometimes that can scare people. And I've had these conversations in the industry mm -hmm. where, you know, where people have said, oh, we can't book this for this because, you know, they don't know how to act or they don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and my answer has always been, well, they haven't been allowed in. So they're self-taught. Exactly. And when you're self-taught, you just do what you know. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's certain procedures and structures and protocol, they mm -hmm. can be shown that mm -hmm. as you go along. But that's only if you engage and show them that. Yeah. They're still getting a job done, but they're just not adhering to the protocols that you believe need to be adhered to. Mm -hmm. So show them the respect for doing the job and help them to understand the protocols. And if you do that, I think you'll find that it will be very easy for you and you're not going to have any problems. But this whole thing of, oh, well, you know, they're, they, they're, they're rowdy or they're this or they're that, or da, da, da. it's like, they're, they're self-taught, they're entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because they weren't allowed in, the gatekeepers didn't allow them in and didn't give them the education. So they educated themselves. And not all of that is exactly how the industry would like it and wrapped up in a boat. And and it's like yourself, you know, you've had to go on the road and road manage and do all the rest of it. And that's where, you know, the industry need to start addressing, needs to start addressing things when you're hiring. You need to have a black person or at the very, very, very least, somebody of ethnic origin and somebody that comes from socioeconomic backgrounds in the room that understands the language just because somebody speaks slightly differently to how you speak it doesn't make them any less intelligent than you are you just have to understand what it is they're saying and all of those stereotypes and those uh judgments on people that might speak different that you know they're dressed different um their mannerisms are different you know all of that can lead to missing out on amazing fantastic talent and you're seeing this because you're seeing these young people what as you mentioned working with their mate and mm -hmm. getting streams up and all of a sudden they've gone from council estate to millionaires yeah now though that talent could have been in your organization but you didn't like how they spoke so mm -hmm. you thought they were stupid they're not stupid wow. <laughs> and, and and that's what it is it's looking at those types of things that's why with power up those are the types of things we're trying to address that's why we wanted industry buy-in because we wanted the industry to understand, okay, cool. We could do this and go and get funding here, there and everywhere. But you know what? If the industry doesn't buy into it and participate in it, nothing changes because you have to understand the differences. You have to understand the changes that you need to make. And if you're going to post a black square and say you stand in solidarity, well, then show me. Stop <laughs> talking and show me. And, and, and that's what it's about, really. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I just wonder if I could um, bring Lavender in, into, um, into this conversation, actually, because, um, you know, I, I just feel like there's, there's, there's some things that, you, that Ben has said here, um, which are super, super important. Um, I, for one, grew up uh, in Southeast London. Um, the way I would speak was more akin to something like central casting on EastEnders. I couldn't walk into um, a, an orchestra back in the day um, in my, it, well, I wouldn't say Chelsea, it was a tracksuit, would have definitely been a tracksuit. <laughs> my tracksuit, um, you know, with with my beatbox and as I used to listen to my, to my reggae, uh, my sounds, um, I couldn't have done that. You need to switch codes to go into spaces. Mm -hmm. And for me, all of that stuff has to stop. Um, and you know, I know you're you're enduring that um, now in 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 effect because you it 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 has to be difficult to be yourself in these spaces. I just wondered if you could share um, your thoughts on that with us. Um, I think I've had an interesting ride because I was born in Hackney, and then when I was about five, I moved to Hampshire, and so my code just became this like middle class white nature okay okay of, like this is this is how I was communicating with mm -hmm. people and they're like mm -hmm. oh yeah you you speak weird you speak mm -hmm. like us and I'm like yeah because I grew up here like what do you expect me to speak like uh -huh. mm -hmm. um 
but I, I didn't I didn't actually realize so my mom always told me like you got to work extra hard. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I will. Like, I want to. What's the issue? I didn't realise it was an issue until someone turned around. And it was just, it was in the lead up to a concert in school. And someone turned around and was like, you're the only black person here. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, thank you for pointing that out. I didn't want to recognise that. But now you have. So, you know, and that, and from that moment, I was like, oh, God damn, like, these people, this is in their heads. And I'm, I'm here just trying to get through I'm living the music I'm enjoying it I'm getting to know the people and then that kind of reality of like these people are thinking you don't fit here you're Mm. weird like Mm. this isn't normal (laughs) like why are you here and from that moment on I was like right this is it like I have to live my life differently now I have to tread carefully I have to understand and play the game and that's annoying like it takes time and effort I've been burnt out so many times Mm -hmm. and I don't think there was ever a point where I code switched out of that just mm-hmm. because that it was survival to the point of it becoming me, like my personality. And when you meet me, I'm this like happy, bubbly person. Like I couldn't care, like I'm the most honest. But at the same time, like I'm not what I grew up in. Like I'm so raw. I'm this like, <laughs> I'm this open, queer, messy just want to do everything and anything possible and the classical industry especially is the opposite of that Mm -hmm. it's like Mm -hmm. you learn your scales and now you do this gig to the t and then you go home and it's like what like this is fun this is music we're meant to be celebrating why are we doing this why is this stressful um and i think i only code switched out of that when I actually began to create a black family in the music mm-hmm. industry, mm-hmm. which only happened within the past two years. Mm-hmm. I never had a black music teacher. I never saw any black faces till I got to university. Mm-hmm. I didn't really have any black colleagues in or- orchestra band rehearsals until I got to university. Um, so yeah, like my interaction was nothing until I moved out of Hampshire. I moved to Manchester and I was like, wow. There are actually black people in, this group, in the music industry. Like, this is crazy. Um, and even with composition, I started that late because I thought you had to be dead white and male to be a composer, like legit. <laughs> like, I didn't think it was a thing. <laughs> and then my mum was like, oh, there's this summer school. Like, you should try it out. And I was like, what? No, like composing. What is that? Like, no, I'm not Mozart. Sorry, I'm, I've got to be dead first before someone recognises me. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And then after that, like having that experience, I was like, okay, this is doable. But why did I never learn that you could be a composer? Like, why can I still not see a face like me in the industry? Um, Like the people I look up to are just coming to light in terms of people in kind of older genres from romantic Baroque to now. And then now it's literally people like my age and like, probably like mid 20s to like mid 30s these are the people that I'm literally friends with but they're also my idols and now I'm having to become my own idol just to like be comfortable in the industry it's mad like the classical industry every time I look at it it's it's a crazy world and yeah I just barely code switch out of it I can barely Mm -hmm. relax until I Mm -hmm. get back home and I'm like ah, okay this is I can write something now that's not like I don't know that even within the composition industry, there's still a lot of stereotypes as to what is expected, especially as a contemporary composer. Mm. It's mad. Like even in America, it's so, so much more different to how it's treated here. And the fact that I want to do something that's groove based, that you can dance to, that has rhythm, that has harmony, that has, you know, jazz, that is influenced by the pop music as well as classical, that seems so weird and far fetched to people in the composition industry because. British or Eurocentric music has stemmed from kind of weird harmonies to electro to a combination and all of that. It's not acknowledged any of the Black British history that we've had Mm. in this country. Like music wise, we've contributed so much, but for some reason, like this country alone just refuses to acknowledge like the wealth and the, the depth of like the the history that we've contributed musically like it's so far-fetched and again I've only learned about that in the past two years I was never taught it I had to teach myself that's my own heritage and I wanted to come to uni to learn that 
mm-hmm. and nothing and I won't and that won't happen for another couple of years even though it is so ingrained in our culture like everything we do is influenced but by what we've created and yet there's just an ignorant like a complete like offensive ignorance to just put that to the side and say no we're going to continue with Stravinsky because that's in the canon like this is our concert it's like well, they, there are people living wanting to make a living wanting to collaborate with musicians with artists with managers with promoters with programmers that you're just willfully ignoring black and white like of any kind of like background but yeah particularly black and you know particularly female as well um non-binary trans homosexual like there's a whole massive community that people are like just completely ignoring um and yeah that was a big run and it really gets me no 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 but you 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 made you made some like really key points like some of that is is tradition and some of that is stereotype because i look after some producers for example we do a lot in the sync world and whilst they do everything from grime afro beats r&b hip-hop they're also orchestral producers like they they create orchestral sync music real kind of film music and it's always such a struggle for me to explain to sync agents and and, and the rest that, yeah, these guys do that and they've had this in the charts and they've had that in the charts, but they also do orchestral. And they're like, but they're black. They do this. (laughs) But they're black. It seems so far-fetched. They're like, that's impossible. (laughs) Like, how can you put the two and two together? Like, that just doesn't happen. It's Mm -hmm. like, actually, we do exist and we making so much cool music that should also be played alongside or instead of the canon that should be celebrated now and in some way like I'm also um, a producer as well and singer songwriter so like breaking in to the pop industry is so much easier than breaking in as a composer because the way they treat it in the pop industry or popular music is you you take the music now and you celebrate the music now Whereas in the Western or in Western classical music, you take the music still from 200 years ago and counting and you only celebrate that. And it's like, well, these people are actually living, like, come on. These are the, this is the culture, the celebration of music now. And we're still not put, like prioritizing that in any of our programs. Well, the only reason my, so my producers get taken seriously because is because that they're, they're sync award winners. Um, because even so when they've had to I, work doubles hard to get an award to exactly. then be recognized which is also the other issue of all of this is the fact that you don't exist until you've burnt yourself into the ground to then get the same opportunities as everyone else yeah you have to be exceptional basically yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. like and, and literally that's jesus a, <laughs> that's, that's across the industry it's you mm-hmm. have to be exceptional if you're an a if you're in marketing if you're in pr if you notice a lot of the um, professionals that are doing exceptionally well in the commercial field are exceptional at what they do. It's not, it's, you know, their peers, yeah, you know, not, really. certain people, but some of their peers are not on the same level, but because they're exceptional at what they do, they're able to be in that position. Whereas, you know, someone that isn't black is able to be in that position with half of what they have. And it's that pressure that that is extremely unfair, extremely difficult and leads to people quitting because they have to do twice as much in order to break through that glass ceiling and to move up a level as somebody that isn't black. And, you know, that's that is what these these companies need to start addressing. And this isn't the norm, like for any institution organization that's watching this like it isn't the norm to burn yourself out and work doubles hard and be stubborn and be ambitious to get to where you're going like you have to start bringing down this separate ladder that you have for us to the same levels everyone else even lower Mm -hmm. just so we can break into the industry because like the barriers it's just walls and walls that you put up that prevent us from getting in and people don't have that energy the stamina the money the you know the stubborn the pure stubbornness because that's what it takes to try mm-hmm. and break into like senior management and those positions of success mm-hmm. and so yeah it's just 
there are small minute people that do have that and like good on them it's amazing but for everyone else and especially young people especially people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds like they have so many other things to worry about yeah let alone like working themselves over and over and over again just to reach that uh, just a basic level of stability and, and like sometimes happiness really, sometimes it's not every day it's not every day hashtag black excellence some yes. days it's hashtag black average mm-hmm. black okay <laughs> yeah. and that it's should be the norm else, as, as right? it is for everyone else for everyone like, else yeah i completely hear what you're saying yeah yeah completely yeah. i hear that i hear that um uh, this is a conversation I think can just just run and run and run and um, you know there's some amazing points that everyone's made I would just st- just say to to uh, um, some of the comments that were made at the end there um, I, I, I would just add um, Lavender that um, unfortunately I think for some uh, for most classical music audiences um, they still think that composers are all from um, the dead white male um, category, which is um, uh, something else, I won't, I won't go into. But um, <laughs> I'll get there one day, don't you? You, worry, you certainly <laughs> will, and we're rooting for you, Lavender. We are rooting for you. Um, <laughs> but until then, more life, please. Yes, please, please. I would like to live as long as possible. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> please, keep going. And uh, look, those last words bring to an end today's discussion. Um, it was really interesting to hear the views of all of our guests. Um, there's been an overwhelming message from today's session. The UK music industry has to do better by people of colour. Our talent is rich, but I'm afraid to say most of us are not. Those rewards are to be reaped by people who don't look like us, those who are at the helm of this sector, the gatekeepers. Change is long overdue. We must level the playing field and value everyone in our community and eject discrimination. It's been an honour and a privilege to be on the call with our guest today. Um, I have to say, I certainly feel um, like I'm not one of the people who is maturing, but I am definitely in the older bracket. Um, but uh, an honour, all the same, it has been. Uh, my thanks to Lavender, Ben, Audrey, and Cheryl. Uh, my thanks also to Sound City, Guest House, and of course, TuneCore. Uh, to find out more about Black Lives in Music, please visit www.blim.org.uk. I hope you've enjoyed this this, this discussion um, and found it interesting. I've found it thoroughly, thoroughly fascinating. Uh, thanks to everyone for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.